Welcome to this next lecture where we will begin to discuss more the specific techniques of how to use um, both Adobe Premiere, but they will not be specifically uh, Adobe Premiere focused. It will be techniques you can use in Premiere, but we will discuss more the overall methodology of sketching with animation and video. So the first part here will be the one where we actually discuss why is it actually a good representation tool to use video and animation. And we will watch uh, a couple of examples, but that will mainly be in part two of this video lecture where we will dive in and show some different examples of how students in the previous years has made different kinds of service design representations through video and animation. Um, so again, this is sort of a hook tie on the design fiction video lectures where hopefully you all uh, now kind of get the concept of what design fiction is, that this deliberate use of diegetic prototypes to suspend disbelief about change is basically something to do with when we actually have a specific intention to explore a design space through these diegetic prototypes, that is that we actually create narrative scenarios in which we take our service concept, touch point, whatever we're actually imagining to bring into the world and try it out inside a scenario as if it was already real. And we do that not to cheat the um, audience or our users, but actually to make them uh, immerse themselves enough so they can actually have empathy and imagine that they're actually uh, in this use case or another user is actually doing this. So we can actually have a discussion about the change that we are proposing in this um, scenario. And hopefully we had this sort of small recipe here. Use this as a constant checklist when you're uh, doing your group work. Are you actually creating a story here? And how little or how much do you actually need to create a story? And what are you actually prototyping inside the story world? Is it clear what the service design concept is? And is it clear that you actually raise some explicit questions about how this um, concept might actually benefit or create different situations that are also might not be beneficial for users. All in all, so you actually create this discursive space that is a space where people actually can reflect on your idea when you share this with them as a piece of communication. And again, what we're diving into now is basically tools of representation for how these different scenarios might play out. And as you'll see in the different techniques that I'm going to show you, some of them are very low fidelity, some of them are more high fidelity, some are better at representing some pieces of technology, some are better at uh, representing uh, service design at a macro level, some are better at representing at a micro level, at an interface level. Um, but common for all of this is that you have to think of this as tools to basically say, how far out in the scope are we? And how will we, in the combination of the different scenarios that you build, how will we actually in that way have explored the domain, our basic, our local hill climbing, if you remember that model? How will we have rem sort of resolved different issues, discussed, maybe raised new questions? And all in all, how have you uncovered this service design problem? And uh, maybe some of you have already by now uh, looked into using the design fiction matrix. Um, to basically use the uh, lessons learned, the state of the art, the uh, probability, the data that you already have, or the misconceptions you've uncovered from user studies or um, the other web empirical sources, to basically begin to say, okay, can you actually use some of the stuff you already have to propose these what-if scenarios? And if we are sort of checkmark with those things, then we are basically ready to say, okay, how do we then represent these what-if scenarios? And as I have talked briefly about in one of the other videos, one of the common things that we do in uh, design is that whenever we have a what-if question, we rapidly turn to sketching, turn to traditional pen and paper design sketching to basically doodle out our ideas. And that's not just because that designers like doodle, it's because there is a lot of theoretical evidence for a lot of studies which have shown that when designers sketch, they actually tend to 
ideate more. They tend to sort of get new ideas that weren't present before they actually began to visualize what they were thinking in their head. So there is this tendency to think about that we can actually not just communicate, but we're actually also thinking actively while we are sketching. That is some of the groundwork made by a guy like Ferguson, who talks about that there are different types of sketches, thinking sketches, talking sketches, and prescriptive t- uh, prescriptive t- uh, sketches. The thinking sketch is when we doodle, the talking sketch is when we communicate, and the prescriptive is when we try to guide people. For example, when we create a video lecture, that would be a prescriptive tech sketch, I guess. But there is this evidence that we are having what they call lateral transformations when we do sketching. So be mindful of that because that might be one of the challenges of not sitting together doing this group work. Be sure to articulate, maybe in a voice chat where it's only your group members who can hear you talking while actually doing this stuff. Talk to each other because new ideas will arise from just sitting and actually representing things visually. Um, But besides that, basically my favorite way of thinking about uh, sketching is uh, Paul Klee's wonderful quotation of that a sketch is simply taking a line for a walk. And that's basically what you're going to sort of think of that you're doing when you sit and do it either in static sketches or in video and animation sketches. You are simply taking a visual medium for a walk in your mind and in your ideation. So don't think about it as something that has to be a drawing, a piece of art or something that is high fidelity with clear and very nice visuals. It is very rough. It is a way of thinking about design. But also, as we talked about in one of the uh, design fiction videos, is that one of the problems we often have with static sketching mediums, be it pen and paper sketches or wireframes or other mediums like that, is that they, they are good for a lot, but they aren't that good for dynamics. So even though that in the storyboard up there, I try to show, okay, we actually show some movement, I try to indicate what the focus of our actor is, but there is something's missing. There is a lot of dynamics that are not there when we only have statics. And um, Bill Buxton actually said this very, very nicely when he, uh, back in the days, described this way of what experience design was for him. That he talked about that a lot of digital, especially design, a lot of design in the digital domain focuses a lot of stages inside a design. So we show interfaces, we do drawings of interfaces. But in a field like experience design and service design especially, we're dealing with a lot of things that have to do with time, having to do with everything that happens in, so to speak, in the transition between the stages. And that in-between is really, really important for design. And it is a really, really tough thing for a designer to actually represent in static uh, sketches. Even though that we have nice tools like uh, blueprints and customer journeys, there is still this abstraction over, okay, what actually happens in these transitions. Um, So it could be a way of putting it, if we have two uh, quickly drawn figures here that I've drawn, um, how did he come from point A to point B? There could be a gazillion of ways for that to happen. And even when I began to draw out more stages, we still don't have all the information, basically. We still don't have information about the momentum. Did he really, uh, you know, prepare himself for a long time to make this long jump? Or was it a quick jump? Um, There is a lot of information lacking. Even though we can create more and more stages, there is still the transition um, that we're missing here, basically. And just to show you what I mean, um, I showed you in the design fiction um, video lecture, I showed you this knowledge navigator concept that Apple came up with back in the Uh, late 80s and early 90s this pre basically ipad concept and i showed you the um, the video sketch uh, the design fiction scenario of how a university professor would be able to use this um but here again it comes that the aspect of transition basically show that the experience actually is in not in the individual stages of the system but as part of the interaction what happens between the stages I thought we should see one more example. This is a one of the other design fiction sketches that they did for the Knowledge Navigator back in uh, 1990, I think. And that was when they pro- began to propose how would people actually develop software for a platform like this? Who could benefit? How could we do that? 
and they prepare, proposed that you could make maybe as here software that could help dyslectic persons, people who are having a, a hard time reading, and actually use this computers, this uh, Intel, uh, this AI and its speed synthesis, its uh, access to the internet, etc., to actually help a person who might be stigmatized for not being able to read, uh, to better read. And none of what we see in this sketch is, of course, real software. But you will see here how important it actually is to represent the transition and not just show the interface of this proposed product. Let's see it here. The teachers may not want to humiliate the student. A lot of times, someone who's 30 or 40 years old is so ashamed of not being able to read uh, that uh, the, the interaction with other people may be quite intimidating, whereas the computer is not. After filling the engine with oil, the coil wire should be grounded and the engine cranked by the starter motor until the oil pre... What's this word? Pressure. Oh, pressure. Until the oil pressure gauge reads 10 pounds. Would you like to go on to lesson six? Uh, no, I, I want to read this. So here it also simulates how you can actually make OCR screen reading and translate it into a readable text on a computer. The Oakland A's begin an important home stand tonight. I think this is one of the most wonderful design fiction scenarios ever created. It tells a short little story, and it shows a diegetic prototype, and it creates a discursive space for us to discuss. Okay, this is actually a platform. This is not just software made by Apple. This is something where you could actually imagine different use cases where the technology could come in hand. And now do remember, this is a 30-year-old um, thoughts of technology. And three years ago, actually, a Danish company launched a application for the iPad, which could actually do exactly this. Help a user and help him clarify whenever he actually were in doubt of how to uh, pronounce a word. The interesting thing here is, this was in extremely simple visuals. We could do this in Adobe Premiere this day in like five minutes. It's just still images and basically stop motion animation of the screen highlighting but you can see here the importance of actually having the transitions here. If you had shown this as a storyboard, we would simply not have gotten the same sort of notion of, okay, how would this actually help this person? This person actually actually also acting out and say, you can hear that he's actually in doubt and stuff like that. So it goes to show that video and here a small bit of animation is really, really powerful. And what we often do when we say that we use video like this in a design fiction storytelling way to show these diegetic prototypes is actually that we're um, leveraging a lot on a method known inside of the design community as a wizard of awesome. And it basically is that we use a technique from that old uh, 1939 uh, movie with the Wizard of Oz, where we basically hide the simulation mechanics behind a veil and then represent something that is real enough for the users to actually um, simulate the experience, to actually show this transition. And just to be sure that you know what I'm talking about, when I say Wizard of Oz, I'm going to show you the, the exact scene from the old classic movie, uh, which I hope that you've all, all seen, or else you have the time now that you're in quarantine, basically. Um, but if you haven't seen it, I'm going to show you a, a scene from the very end of the movie, so, spoiler alerts, that this is in the moment where Dorothy, our main character, has um, killed the Wicked Witch of the West and now returns to the wizard, to the Grand Wizard of Oz, to ask for him to use his magic to actually help her get back to Kansas again. Let's see uh, where the method Wizard of Oz comes from. The Wicked Witch is dead. And I believe my eyes. Why have you come back? Please, sir. We've done what you told us. We brought you the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. 
We melted her. Oh, you liquidated her, eh? Very resourceful. Yes, sir. So we'd like you to keep your promise to us, if you please, sir. Not so fast. Not so fast. I'll have to give the matter a little thought. Go away and come back tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, but I want to go home now. You've had plenty of time already. Yeah. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you'll keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great and Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. You are? Uh, I don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. You humbug! Yeah. Yes, it's exactly so. I'm a humbug. Oh, you're a very bad man. Oh, no, my dear. I, I'm a very good man. I'm just a very bad wizard. Well, what about the heart that you promised Tin Man? So he's just a very bad wizard, basically. And that uh, that's actually the point. That's where the inspiration for this method has come into computer science and into user experience design. Uh, Bill Buxton, in his book, actually points to this as a great case, that up until the point where Toto, that's the dog that you actually saw uh, removing the veil, up until it actually revealed what was behind the curtain here, all the reactions that Dorothy, our main character, and her companions had, they were basically... Uh, psychologically, anthropologically, sociologically valid in the sense that they actually conveyed a experience, an emotional response to what was portrayed in front of them. Funny thing, <laughs> by the way, you could easily see where a movie like Star Wars got its inspiration from the Tin Man and the uh, dog-like, uh, Wookiee-ish uh, character. It's a wonderful movie. You should all see it, basically. But here, the point is that Wizard of Oz is all about showing something in a way that makes us suspend this disbelief. That is basically where design fiction borrows this term, that this is all that we need. We need to uh, simulate something, not to make it look realistically necessarily, but to make it seem probable, to make us immerse ourselves into the emotional response that we should have. Do we actually get it? Can we relate to the user situation? Can we relate to how the technology might work or not work in this context? That's all what we're looking for. And the reason that we do this is, of course, because it is much faster and easier and way, way, way cheaper to find an old man, behind, put him behind a curtain and let him play a wizard than finding a real one. And that's basically what we also do here. It is much faster, easier, and cheaper to actually simulate a large service representation and get some early feedback than having to build everything and having to spend a lot of resources and a lot of manpower on this. So there is this basically kind of um, fake it till you make it philosophy behind what we're doing here. But to turn the mic back to um, Bill Buxton again, he has this wonderful quotation about why we should do more of these explorative representations that he has this thing of saying that, okay, We actually have to, in order to engineer the future of tomorrow, we have to have lived in it yesterday. So that's basically it. We have to experience it. We have to be able to represent our thoughts before we can actually realize them. And in that way, that is the most important thing when talking about fidelity in this entire workshop. That is this slide, basically, where he says that it is the fidelity of the experience that we convey, not the a visual fidelity of the prototype, the sketch, or whatever we try to represent. It is how well do we actually represent the experience that we are proposing, both good and bad. And is it understandable, and is it something that creates this discursive space? So that points to one of my really, really uh, important things to emphasize, especially since that I cannot uh, constantly monitor what you're actually doing in the groups, 
And every year we see people sort of getting stuck because they want things to look nice. They spend hours figuring out a specific detail in the video editing software because ah, it doesn't look right yet. Where I always, when I see that in the groups, I say this one rule. It has to be fast, not perfect what you do. I would rather see you in the groups produce eight very, very rough sketches than then you produce one really, really high fidelity one. So it is really about that you your sketch has to be rough enough so other people will be able to understand and ask questions and not uh, so real and so high fidelity that you only have one sketch so you cannot show the, a variety of either details of your concept or different concepts uh, in total. So it's basically about keep it rough enough so you actually have the time and the resources to simulate more. And that's what it's all about. You can also use Bill Buxton's own criteria that he created both in a paper and later on also in his book, where he basically said, talked about that sometimes we need to be careful that we're not being too didactic in what we show and not answering all the questions instead of raising questions and basically resolving all the things that could happen in our design context because then we might actually be more into prototyping domain that when we do sketching, we should constantly be aware, are we actually being evocative now? Are we suggesting things, suggesting these what-if questions? Are we actually proposing and provoking things instead of being very uh, resolving about things? Are we having something that is tentative, showing that this is just one idea, it might change? And most importantly, probably, is it non-committal? Is it a way where we could say, okay, if it shows up that we had completely missed a point or completely done something wrong here, then it should be non-committal enough to say, okay, we didn't spend more than a couple of hours thinking about this and representing it in a video medium, and then we'll discard it again. It's really, really important. This is um, sort of the definition between that, uh, how a sketch is different from a prototype. And another thing that Boxen talks about later on in the actual book is that that also shows that sketching is not something that you do only on pen and paper. It is how these sort of verbs come to fruition in whatever medium, and that is how you determine whether you're actually sketching. So even though we propose that we use video here and animation tools, it is all about how you use these tools that determine if you're actually doing sketching as your service representation. Um, I, I tend to think of it like this, even though we talk about fidelity a lot and say, okay, the fidelity of the experience is the important thing. There is, of course, a um, difference between what you can actually represent. And there is a low and high fidelity in terms of how realistically we can portray something. Whereas the lowest fidelity is if we just show things by hands and we can move on to words, which are more abstract. We can represent things precisely, but we cannot really visually uh, represent them that precise. And then we have up in the high fidelity, of course, if we coded a prototype or made a, a hi-fi prototype of some industrial design at the touch point or whatever. So there is this sort of mix between it. And the, oh, that was a Lego man. The hypothesis basically is here that, oh, the hello again, basically is here that we can get sort of mid uh, or sort of through these mid to low to mid fidelity tools like video sketches we can get rather high fidelity feedback if we use it as design fictions and that's sort of um, the basic assumption here that even though that we might be proficient in making advanced service representations like this showing an actor map for an example at a macro level um, this might be easy to read for a service designer um, but it would be very complex to read for novices or people outside of our design context. Whereas if we began to think of it as more like an animation, like here some students used um, the uh, slide software, um, which I can't remember the name of right now, um, but you probably uh, know, know what I mean here, um, where they actually try to show an animation of how a entire actor map can be navigated through and there's a speech on it uh, I've just killed it now it's in Danish but uh, 
vi kalder det der sted idémaskinen. Oh, the software is called Pretzi. Når idéen kommer til platformen, kommer den, får man som medarbejder optager og hjælper idémaskine-appen, som guider, redigerer og uploader idéen. And then you can see they move into the scenario afterwards. But that, that's basically the point here. Even though this is not a representation of this, it might as well have been. So it goes to say the transition, the aspect of actually telling a story instead of just representing it statically, it will do something. It will create another kind of way to communicate to an audience and also then to gather feedback. Um, so basically that's video sketching. I've included here a quotation from uh, um, Wendy McKay, who is one of the original sort of uh, the one who defined how to use this um, tool where she talks about how basically video can simulate technology and allow users to experience a technology that does not yet exist. And you might, when you read this quotation, think, okay, it sounds an awful lot like the definitions of diegetic prototypes in design fiction. And that's completely true. This is basically a method that existed before design fiction but more exists sort of without a um, permanent home theoretically. It was a method that was used a lot in um, human-computer interaction, user experience design, but it didn't really have a framing of how to actually understand this up until uh, design fiction. So be mindful of that when, we, when you read about video sketching and uh, video prototyping, that up until design fiction, it really was sort of a loose method within the field. A more clear way of thinking about it is someone like Carol, who talks about that is actually a more broad way of thinking that Design fiction and video is one specific way of showing how scenarios can work in a design context. So that is how we can actually get a view of the design situation from a bit higher up. We're not inside the design space, we are outside and looking into a situation that you basically direct. And we specifically use diegetic prototypes and we use video and animation as our medium. So think of it as you're basically just designing scenarios here. So that's the video part. Um, then the important sort of uh, extra thing to mention here uh, before we close this first part of the uh, lecture is, of course, the role of animation. Because in the original text about video sketching, you won't see the word animation really mentioned. But they mention a lot about simulation. They mention a lot about sort of implicitly that you want to add something that you cannot record with a camera. And how will you do that then? You will, of course, add it as a post-production, as a special effect. And that's basically where animation comes in. Um, one of my favorite way, way, ways of thinking of animation is uh, taken from Jan Kubin, one of uh, um, my great mentors uh, who once worked at Pixar. He is actually the inventor of Cars, the entire concept of Cars. He is uh, owning uh, some part of the IP and that. And he once told me that for him... As a professional animator, what animation could do was that it could exaggerate and emphasize the essence of reality. And I think there's a wonderful way of thinking about it, that through animation, we can sort of take something that does not exist and scale it up in a way that it will demand attention. So we can create a diegetic prototype through using animation and then make it stand out as something that the audience will actually react to instead of just showcasing something that we will really not um is it the phone he wants me to look at or is it this design there when using animation it sort of demands intention because it tends to exaggerate a bit and you'll see that in many of the examples in the next video lecture that that actually is quite a uh, good strategy to sometimes play with for example humor or play with the exaggeration because even though we distort reality a bit we are also actually um, showcasing how we want to emphasize a specific element. And most of the time, at least in most of the examples I've seen, the audience can easily um, sort of um, see the difference between, okay, this is the way it's visually represented to make me actually react to it, and then begin to actually fill out the holes themselves. So the discursive space is intact, even though that we might distort things a bit. Here's Ralph Stevenson, who has this wonderful way of talking about it, that when we do animation, as opposed to classic film, classic video, what we can, bring, can record with a camera, 
the difference basically is that we have full control. And that's basically also it here. We have the control to actually simulate things that does not exist yet and simulate things in a more abstract way than what could be captured with a camera. So to think of, of this as compared to before when we talked about the experience is in the transition. This aspect of having to show what is between the stages. If we're going to uh, return to our stick figure from before, then animation basically is what enables us to begin to actually convey the true sort of experience of what happened in that scene. That this guy, okay, he was actually jumping, his momentum was like this and this and that. But of course, to use it in a more um, true uh, narrative of the real world, I've shown you here a case from a, uh, a design that I did a couple of years ago. I was working with the uh, zoological facility, the North Sea Oceanarium. It's basically the blue planet just focused on the North Sea. Um, it's located in northern Jutland. And they had this idea of that they wanted to explore how uh, augmented reality... Yes, again, this was in 2013. Augmented reality was, uh, was the shit back then. Um, and they wanted some ideas on how to actually create a, a fun experience where you could use your phone to sort of, uh, uh, at different aquariums, simulate um, different fish interacting in a fun and engaging way with their families. And we, of course, did a lot of static sketches, like you see up there, did on uh, tablets, where we tried to show the concept, would it be fun if you could sort of distort the video of the human beings on top of some uh, animated fish. We did some sketches of the fish, and we did actually a, some clickable mock-ups where it was just static fishes. You can see them uh, up in the, in, the, um, in the right corner. But there was a lot of resistance, and there was a lot of people, ah, we don't know if people will actually think this is fun, this is something that we should invest our money in. And then I did a 10-second animation down below here. And they, I took uh, uh, Klaus, who's in front of it here, as my sort of test subject. And I did this animation in, I think, um, less than an hour, 40 minutes or so from filming to actually having it done. Um, practice make perfect here. And then I showed that specific thing that you're going to see here. I showed that to Klaus's uh, son and daughter. And we basically looked for, would they think it was fun to actually see their father being uh, manipulated in this way at a visit? So you can see, really, really simple. Again, there's nearly no story. But again, there is a story. There is, okay, there's a person standing at an aquarium. I have simulated, it's just a still footage of an iPhone, and I did this animation of the fish by actually just a, uh, taking a 3D model of their fish that they already had. I scanned it from their toy store. So it was really, really quick to do all of this and simulate how would this effect actually play out. And this 10-second animation bit was essentially what got us uh, 250,000 Danish kroners to begin to develop this project. So it does show that this actually has a power to communicate ideas and to actually let us test an idea. I tested it here. Did the Klaus's son and daughter actually think it was fun? They thought it was hilarious to see their father doing this, uh, being exposed in this way. So that actually qualified some of, at least made our hypothesis stronger that we had something here that might be fun. And as I showed you in the design fiction sketch, we could, of course, elaborate this in screen captures. But even though we could capture all the frames, there is some things about the pacing, the rhythm, and the user anticipation that we simply cannot represent with stages alone. We simply need this way of communicating the transitions when doing design fiction scenarios. And I think that is especially true also when we do service design, transition between touch points. Transition between a user layer, a backstage layer, all of that. And a model to sort of uh, reflect on this would be that a good way of proposing how we should make reflective videos is presented by um, Buo and Moore, who wrote this uh, wonderful book, Designing with the Video. Um, they co-wrote a chapter in that and also has written a paper where they propose a simple model. Say, okay, when we do... Um, design scenarios, what we would today call design fictions, it's important that we actually answer these 
three questions in a video. What is interesting is the focus. So that's where the exaggeration part, what do we actually pull forward and say, this is actually what I want you to look at. Then comes the discursive sort of the way of framing it inside a story world. So create a reflection point, create some kind of situation that actually answers why is this interesting? Why is it interesting for the user to see? And then the discursive space in the end, the reframing part. How does this change my understanding? What questions does it actually rise? What it, will it make me as a user, a stakeholder? What will it actually make me think? And how will it change my understanding, basically? So if we can sort of check that and use that as a reference guide for you when you do this, focus, reflect, reframe. How will you represent these three elements through your video sketches? Then you will already come a very long way. And sometimes it's also about um, not just showing one possible uh, reframing or one possible focus, but actually also uh, showing multiple sort of ideas and sort of showing the way towards how you actually ended up with this idea. And that's going to be uh, one of the final examples here in lecture, this first of the video uh, sketching lectures. It's a case from a couple of years ago when we did a collaboration with Bang & Olufsen, BNO, the Danish uh, TV and loud speaker um, company. And they had challenges. This was back in 2012. They had the challenge of figuring out what should the future of controlling a TV be. So this was way before smart televisions. This was way before gesture-based controls of the Nintendo Wii. And um, let's try to break this uh, video down. The first one here was where they, uh, the group tried to show a lot of the different ideas that we have in, had in a workshop. Let's see here. You see the first one here is uh, split screens. They, the next one is perspective. What if, depending on where you sit, it changes perspective. Another view of split screens. What if you had tactile remote controls where you could negotiate what to see? What if you had gestures with hands like the Xbox Kinect? That was a nice idea, but how? what about if you then disagreed on what to see? How would you navigate that as a user? And then they got this idea, okay, gesture-based navigation is great, but um, maybe we should use something else. This was a pin that I actually just was waving. So they ended up with this, what if we didn't have to press buttons? And let's see the next part. That's when they then begin to develop the, the basic idea of their um, final concept. These students were, of course, interaction designers, so they were very much focused on the interactive aspect, so you don't show a lot of context here. Um, but they showed the rendering of this interaction device, the maestro, as they came up with. And up until this point, this seems like a novel idea. Okay, they're inspired by the maestros of an orchestra. Seems like a novel idea, and we have this very persuasive, very high-fidelity rendering. But up until this point, it's just a novel idea. We haven't really communicated a user scenario where we can actually imagine how this will be. Up until the next bit here. Jamen, det er meget folk, som gerne vil have det nemt, noget funktionelt og noget nemt, hvor man ikke skal bruge en masse tid på at vedligeholde. Og gå og slå græs og sådan noget. Lige præcis. Så er aktionen i gang. Nordjyllands politi. Det er en bedre dialog mellem behandlere og patienter, der har givet resultater på åringer. Antallet af patienter, der spændes fast til deres senge, er ikke bare halveret. Patienter er ofte fixeret i meget kortere tid end tidligere. Vi er meget glade for det. Det er positivt. Det er... So this is, of course, an example of something rather high fidelity, not something you necessarily should aim for. And there is a lot of things here you could say, okay, 
they definitely show us uh, what the focus is. They also show us reflection points. What if you use this kind of remote and what if we had this kind of interface design? What if all of this was working? But you could discuss if their reframing is actually that great. Mm, it doesn't explicitly at least tell us where are scenarios where this uh, way of directing your television might not be a good idea. For example, what if I get grow tired or um, what if I am in just, you know, uh, sitting in the sofa being lazy? How would it then work? So there is room for improvements. And this is one thing that I really will encourage you to do is be critical. Also show the aspects of where your design might fail and address how you would actually change that. Um, but it does go to show that, okay, breaking down things, showing the different ideas, that might actually, the first uh, couple of ideas you showed them, that I actually might have been their four to five uh, first video sketches and then editing them together into this last one would be the final one. So you can also use your previous sketches to sort of show the journey of how you ended up there. And that's sort of the, the last point that I'll make here is basically that sometimes we need to think about this sort of in a horizontal and vertical way. This is a model by Jakob Nielsen, one of the famous usability experts of the domain, who talks about you can have these horizontal and vertical ways of thinking when we do prototypes. And then I, I have drawn in this uh, red square in the middle to basically say that normally when we talk about features and functionality in a system, be it a digital system or a service system, we often talk about, okay, do we show the entire width of features, all the features, and then don't really have that, that much interactivity, for example, that much vertical depth. We don't have that much functionality built in. And you can also say, okay, sometimes like in the hardware prototyping workshop you will have with Dan, you will probably um, be diving a lot into a vertical prototype, one specific touch point where you will show a very deep interaction, very deep level of fidelity of something done there. And you will never in either way show the full system. And that is also true when we do animation-based sketches with video here. Know that you're directing a scene, basically. And uh, depending on how many, how many sketches, how many scenes that you do in your sketch, you will be showing only sort of a small quadrant of the potential features and functionality. So that gives you a responsibility for not just showing the quadrant where everything is really, really nice and works perfectly and have the optimal, preferable user situation, but also show us the possibilities, the plausible um, situations that might be less good for the user. Be honest and be transparent of both the positive and negative sides of your idea, and then maybe address in the video, in the sketches, how you could overcome them as designers. So... That is basically our um, end of this first uh, video lecture here um, on sketching with animation. In the next video, we will dive much further into actually sketching in uh, Adobe Premiere. So that will be sort of our uh, point of venture for the next um, 45 minutes to an hour. I'll show you some examples. It will be a lot of just showcasing the techniques. So of course, we'll have to see the sketches. So it will take a bit of time. Um, but tune in for seeing some examples in the next uh, video lecture. See you all.